I have had a terribly, horribly busy day converting oxygen to carbon dioxide. Now I just need a moment to breathe. Welcome to another Tavern Sim production, this time on gas exchange in animals. So today your learning objectives are going to be to name the factors that are essential for effective gas exchange in organisms and link these to fixed law. Explain why larger organisms have evolved specialist gas exchange systems linked to surface area and volume ratio. Describe gas exchange in humans and explain why internal lungs have evolved. Describe gas exchange in fish. Describe gas exchange in other animals, insects, reptiles and birds. So we'd like you to have a little go at this question here, uh, which is what makes a good gas exchange surface? There's a few diagrams at the bottom to help you. If you pause the video. Okay, the answers that we've got are, first of all, a large surface area, thin walls, so not very far for oxygen carbon dioxide to diffuse across, large concentration gradient, and numerous capillaries in the gas exchange system like the lungs. Now, hopefully you remembered back to um, the diffusion topic and were able to use fixed law to help you to work out what makes um, a good exchange surface. So we've got an image here of, of the um, alveoli in the lungs and they have a very large surface area. Is it as big as um, a tennis court? I, I think, think so. If you, if you lay them all out. I think it is. Yeah, a concentration gradient is maintained by the movement of the blood and also ventilation. So by the fact that air is coming in and out. And the um, barrier between the capillary and the alveoli are only, each one has a cell thick membrane. So it's only really traveling across two cells to get into the capillary there. And these, this is really cool because actually you could try a few of these at home. You could put in arbitrary numbers. So choose like a surface area value, a concentration gradient value, and thickness value, and just see how those values change the rate of diffusion. Okay, so we've talked about um, having a large surface area um, enabling efficient gas exchange. Um, something that we need to link to surface area is the volume and work out the surface area to volume ratio of organisms. So what we'd like you to do is to pause the video and try and work out the um, figures for the other boxes. Okay, so if you work out the surface area for this second box here, <clears throat> the slightly larger one, you'll find that the surface area is 150, maybe centimetres um, squared. The total volume is 125 centimetres cubed. And then if you do this calculation here, surface area to volume ratio, so that's the surface area divided by the volume, you'll find that now there's a lot less surface area compared to the volume. And this is quite an important factor in gas exchange. Um, if we cut that large block up into lots of smaller blocks, what we're doing effectively is we're increasing the surface area. And as surface area needs to be really large to have a lot of gas exchange, that's a really good thing to do. So here are some examples of figures of where if you cut that block up into one centimeter um, by one centimeter cubes, you will have a humongous surface area of 750. The volume is exactly the same as the block before at 125, but the surface area compared to the volume is now much larger. And that is brilliant for a gas exchange surface. Okay, so looking at these images then, can you just uh, identify, pause the video, and identify which animals have a larger surface area to volume ratio, and um, try and think about why they do as well. Okay, so these are the two that have the largest surface area to volume ratio, and you might have ideas as to, to why that is. Um, so, for example, in things like the penguins and also the beaver, they have to have a very small surface area compared to their volume um, to retain heat. Okay, whereas in this sea slug at the top right hand corner here and the sea spider, um, the sea slug has a larger surface area to volume ratio. It's kind of flat and it's got these funny gill bits at the top back um, to help it pick up food and sort of scavenge among the rocks and stuff like that. And the spider is long and thin, so all of these long thin legs mean that its surface area to volume ratio is very, very high. Right, 
So next question is to think about um, comparing these two organisms here. So we've got a, a big old rhino there compared to a single-celled organism, the amoeba. So um, why do you think larger organisms require a specialised gas exchange system? Now what we mean by that is they don't just simply diffuse gases in through their surface like the amoeba does. Why have larger organisms developed lungs, for example, mm -hmm. and um, a transport system within their body in order to get gases in? And the answer to that is <laughs> because larger organisms haven't got enough surface area to diffuse gas through all of their cells. So if you think about the small cube compared to the larger cube, the surface area to volume ratio decreased. So there's not enough surface for all of those gases to be able to, to reach all of the cells. Okay guys, so for this slide what we'd like you to do is pause the video and label all of these gas exchange structures in a human. Okay, and you should have these as the responses. So we're not going to go through those now, but if you'd like to research them at home and then you can ask questions in class. Yes, yeah, so um, that's the structure of the gas exchange system in humans. We need to talk about how ventilation occurs. And ventilation is basically bringing air in and um, pushing air back out again. So the first diagram here shows inhalation. Air comes in through the mouth down the trachea and into the lungs. Um, but the way that this actually happens is due to the movement of the muscles within the lungs. So we have the internal intercostal muscles which contract and pull the rib cage up and out. We also have the diaphragm um, which is um, at the bottom here, the dome shape and that contracts and flattens slightly when it contracts. Now, the joint effect of these two, um, these two contractions means that we increase the volume of the thorax, which is the area inside the rib cage. An increased volume of the thorax leads to a decreased pressure inside the thorax, which means air is able to rush in down a pressure gradient. On the other side of that is when you're exhaling. <clears throat> so this is basically inhalation but in reverse. So the intercostal muscles will relax. Your diaphragm will also relax and it will become even more dome shaped. The volume in your thorax will decrease, okay? And that will increase the pressure and sort of squeeze air out and cause you to exhale. A couple of key points here, we have internal lungs for a couple of different reasons. To protect them by keeping them inside the body and also to reduce water loss. Now you still have a little bit of water loss when you're breathing out, but if they were on the outside of your body you would have way more. So um, another question for you to think about, why is gas exchange in fish different from mammals? So pause the video. Okay, hopefully you came up with these points. So clearly fish are in water, I'm sure you've got that one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I hope water, got that. Yeah, hopefully. <laughs> water contains a lot less oxygen than the air. Therefore, due to concentration gradients, the, the rate of diffusion is a lot slower in water. Also, um, water is a liquid compared to the gaseous air, so it doesn't flow as freely as air would. Fish also have what's called a very high metabolic rate. They're carrying out lots of chemical reactions very quickly in their cells because they are so active. So they need to get a, a good supply of oxygen. Yeah, definitely. And you can see that by this little chappy here. He's going to be swimming around all the time. Because they never stop swimming, do they? That's true, they don't they sit always down keep on the sofa and watch the tennis. Chill out, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And the last one is that the gills provide a very large surface area over which oxygen flows. So, like we said earlier on, that's essential for gas exchange. Okay, so this is um, showing you an image of the gills. Um, and this is in a cartilaginous fish, such as the shark. <clears throat> so what we've got here, these blue arrows are representing the flow of water. 
and we can see on these gill plates we can see um, the direction that the blood is moving so deoxygenated blood comes in on this side it picks up oxygen from the water and it leaves on the other side now this particular um, type of flow is called parallel flow and that is because the um, blood and the water are flowing in exactly the same direction now parallel flow isn't particularly efficient is it no it's not it's not very efficient at all and in actual fact what we'd like you guys to do is to have a, a read up more on gas exchange in fish because it's it's actually a bit more of a complex process and this is one type of gas exchange um, where, as Sim said before, you're just looking at cartilaginous fish, so things like stingrays and sharks. If you were to focus in on bony fish, like our little parrot fish down here in the bottom left, you would find that it has a very different system of gas exchange. <clears throat> now, this system on the left is what's called countercurrent flow. And countercurrent, as the name kind of suggests, means that the water, these blue arrows, flows in an opposite direction, a counter direction, to the flow of the blood through those capillaries on the gill plate. Okay? <clears throat> now that does really that's an important thing for maintaining a high concentration gradient, again, as fixed law says, something that's really essential, um, for efficient gas exchange or, or maximizing gas exchange so we we m sort of increase your gas exchange of oxygen carbon dioxide by flowing the blood in an opposite direction to the water okay so we're nearly there now we're just talking about a few other animals and how they exchange gases briefly so um, amphibians as we see here the cute little is that a tree frog I think, yeah red, red eyed tree frog red eyed tree frog um, they obviously live on land and also in water so they have different ways of exchanging gases so when they are inactive which is usually on the on the land they would um, exchange gases through the skin okay um, however when they're active they have also got um, lungs as well but they don't have a diaphragm or rib cage, um, so they're not bony like we are. And I think <clears throat> they exchange gases by basically, you know, like frogs have that big uh, bit at the bottom, like, and um, they sort of gulp in air to fill up their lungs. Mm. Another sort of type of gas exchange in um, this time reptiles is a little bit more similar to ours. So reptiles don't li have to live right next to water like amphibians, so they can't gas exchange through their skin because it's waterproof. So they have to have complex internal lungs rather like ours, and they have to ventilate them to maintain a concentration gradient, again like our ventilation in the lungs, um, by using the muscles in their rib cage. So this system in reptiles is actually much more similar to the system that you would see in, in humans. And here we have gas exchange in insects. Now insects are surrounded by an exoskeleton which is waterproof and therefore means that gases cannot um, dissolve and diffuse through. Um, so they've developed things called spiracles, which are basically tiny little holes in the exoskeleton, which is the point of entry and exit for gases. Um, once oxygen, for example, has passed in through the spiracle, it will pass into um, a series of tubes called the tracheae. Um, and the tracheae are the larger tubes and they branch off, as we can see happening here, into teeny, teeny tracheoles. Now, the tracheoles actually penetrate every single cell in the insect. So each cell has its own supply of oxygen arriving, moving down a concentration gradient, and it can take away waste gases such as uh, carbon dioxide. Um, now, when the insect is active, when it's flying around, um, muscular contractions in its abdomen helps to ventilate the tracheae, which basically just means it kind of puffs air along the tracheae and helps to move it along. So you sometimes see crickets and stuff, don't you, sort of, when they're not rubbing their back legs together, yeah. um, sitting there with their little abdomens kind of moving, if, if, if any of you watch insects, <laughs> um, and that is them ventilating themselves. Yeah. Okay, the last one is ventilation in birds, and this is um, slightly more complex, I guess, in terms of the uh, sacs, rather compared to our lungs. Um, but what birds have got 
is complex internal lungs that have a system of air sacs ventilated by movement of ribs, like in humans and reptiles, or other mammals as well. Um, and during flight, a good thing about them is that their flight muscles engage with their gas exchange muscles to ventilate their lungs. Okay, And you can see on the right here this kind of really cool um, up-close image. This is basically all of the air tubes in the lungs. And you can see there's a humongous surface area there. So that would increase gas exchange um, in those birds. Thank you for listening. Thank you. And we'll see you later.